So, are you, did you start it already? Yeah, yeah I, was, okay. I started. So, if you're at the surface of the lake, uh -huh. um, there's usually uh, a barrier between the upper water and the lower water. Mm. So, this is known as the epilimnion. Uh -huh. And the lower water, the hypolimnion. Uh -huh. And that barrier is temperature dependent. Mm. So the differences between uh, the warmer upper water, which will be uh, circulating, and the lower water, which will circulate among itself. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, but they won't mix because there's a difference in the, the density, mm. right? Um, so that's going to be controlled by the wind mm. uh, blowing across the surface. And the amount of light penetration mm -hmm. into the water. So you have uh, solar irradiance. So the time of year mm. will be important. Water clarity. So okay. So that can be important. Mm. And then, um, as I mentioned, you can get in very large lake systems, if the wind is blowing uh, the same direction for a really long time, mm. uh, what will happen is the water will end up getting stacked on one end of the lake. And uh, so if the wind is constantly blowing this direction, yeah. eventually the water will stack up a little bit on this side. Aww. And then when the wind stops blowing, what happens is it will reach a balance and this water will uh, sink so mm. that it reaches its own level. Oh. And what it will do if you have a thermocline present, if you have a barrier between your upper water and your lower water, mm. is that it will depress that barrier or will alter that barrier and it will create an internal wave. Oh. So the thermocline, the barrier between the upper and the lower water, mm. will actually create waves. Oh. And uh, that will flow and it will actually move back and forth across the entire length of the lake. Mm. But where it hits the shorelines, it actually can break the way a normal wave would on the surface. Um, and that can actually disrupt the barrier between the uh, hypolimnion and the epilimnion. Mm. So it can actually result in mixing in these shallower areas. So you might end up getting blooms as a result of that internal wave. Well, so okay. if you were looking for the terminology for that wave, it's sometimes called a siege wave or internal wave. Okay. 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 So that will give you some idea. Uh -huh. All of these things you need to have uh, to get a bloom. You need the nutrients. Mm. But you also need mixing. Mixing of what? Of the water. Uh -huh. Because most of the nutrients are down here. Uh -huh. In most ocean, uh, in most uh, lake systems, mm. the nutrients are all in the bottom. Mm. And so you have to mix those towards the surface because this area is uh, sunlit, right? Uh -huh. it's sunlight uh -huh. uh, for phytoplankton to grow. So you need to have both the nutrients and the sunlight, and usually that requires that the lake is well mixed in order mm -hmm. to do it. So s seasonally, you might see all of these things sort of come into play. Uh -huh. If the uh, inter uh, internal wave is not happening, the uh, nutrients will be set on the bottom? Yes. You need to have some mixing uh -huh. of some kind. So that upwelling uh, a mixing coming of nutrients from the bottom coming to the top can actually be produced just by the wind, even without the internal wave. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be driven by amount of light penetration, mm -hmm. water clarity, and the, and the windiness mostly. Then. Okay. Uh, so nitrogen and phosphorus, which one uh, w will most likely cause algae bloom? So, in uh, for most algae, mm -hmm. uh, they need both. Uh -huh. um, and I think in the Great Lakes, most of the blooms are actually cyanobacteria. Uh -huh. And uh, for cyanobacteria, what you have to actually have happen is uh, you need phosphorus mostly. Okay. Um, you, uh, for most 
algae, you need both phosphorus and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And if it's a diatom bloom, you also need silica. Oh. Um, and in most of the Great Lakes, the silica gets consumed. If you add a lot of this, mm -hmm. and you add a lot of this, mm -hmm. the silica basically gets used up. And oh. so the diatoms will bloom, and then they'll eat up all of the silica, and what you have left is nitrogen and phosphorus, but you don't have any silica. Mm -hmm. And then what will happen is, you'll start off with a diatom bloom, mm -hmm. Diatoms will eat all of the silica, and then uh, you'll get a green algae bloom. Mm. And the green algae will eat most of the nitrogen. Oh. And um, you'll end up with a cyanobacteria bloom. Oh. And the reason for this is cyanobacteria can fixate nitrogen. So they can generate, they can take into gas mm -hmm. and convert it into, actually they convert it into ammonia, but it ends up being nitrate in the end. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, uh, they can make their own from nitrogen gas, which is everywhere, mm -hmm. and dissolved into water everywhere. So they can get nitrogen whenever they want it. And so the only thing they need is phosphorus. Oh, okay. Right? Oh. So diatoms eat all of the silica, green algae will eat all the nitrogen, and then what happens is the cyanobacteria, the only thing that can persist because this is gone and that's gone, but they can make, they can make mm -hmm. their own nitrogen. Uh -huh. So um, it's the sequence of the three usually. Okay. Now, most people don't care. If there's a diatom bloom, people don't care because uh -huh. diatoms, uh, it's a fish food basically. Uh -huh. um, they're not usually not dangerous and it's usually not visible at the surface. Green algae and cyanobacteria, however, are nuisance blooms. And so most of what you see in the Great Lakes is cyanobacteria blooms. Mm. And the reason people don't like it is these can be toxic, yeah. fish can't eat these very well, mm. and so um, you know they take over the surface, they block out the light, they eat up all the oxygen, mm. cause problems for fish. Mm. Yeah. So that sequence is usually what happens. So if you were going to predict when this occurred, uh -huh. the way you could do it is predict when diatoms start to oh. bloom. Then you know that this sequence is going to start to happen. So if you see a diatom right. bloom happening in the water, mm. then you'd expect one of these things to start following, oh. depending on which one of the nutrients are left. Uh, how long will that take if a diatom bloom happen? Just depends on how fast the silica gets eaten up. Oh. Right? Okay. So. But you'd expect the sequence to go diatom bloom, green algae bloom, cyanobacteria bloom, and mm -hmm. this is the one that people are worried about. Uh -huh. So that sort of green paint colored stuff, mm -hmm. that's cyanobacteria mostly. Mm -hmm. And fish can't eat this very easily, other organisms can't eat it very easily, and so mm -hmm. people worry about these things because they're not good nutrients, mm -hmm. whereas diatoms usually the stuff that fish can eat easily. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Okay, <laughs> if you have more questions, you just uh, come talk to me okay. anytime. Okay. Okay.